I was born in Captain John Christman's tent on the headwaters of the Yegua River, near where the small village of Gay Hill was afterward built, in what is now Washington County, Texas, on the 10th of October, 1829. My mother has often told me that at my birth I weighed only three pounds, clothes and all, and that when a week old she slipped her wedding ring over my hand up to my shoulder. At sixteen years of age I weighed only fifty-eight pounds. At the beginning of the war in 1861, I was six feet and one quarter of an inch in height and weighed one hundred and sixty pounds, and my face was as smooth as a girl's and as free from whiskers. In my babyhood days and early childhood, my father determined that I should be a preacher, a missionary to some foreign clime, and he wished me educated with this end in view. I was taught my letters from a Latin grammar and began the study of that language as soon as I mastered the alphabet. Greek and Hebrew followed. When but three years of age, there came into our camp an old man, a Polish exile, a baron of German birth by the name of Hamvaski. He was a graduate of Heidelberg and was a general in the Polish army and had been banished from Europe upon the downfall of Poland. This old man took a great fancy to me, and I almost worshipped him. He taught me my Latin, Greek, and Hebrew lessons and what I liked best, how to box, wrestle, fence with both foil and saber, and how to ride and shoot with the rifle and pistol. Many a long ride over the prairies on his shoulders have I taken, when in search of deer or turkeys or wild animals of that region. When on these tramps he would fill my youthful mind with history of great events that had occurred in ages past. Under his kind and steady hand, for nearly seven years, my young mind expanded rapidly and I was almost as well versed in the languages and ancient histories, and almost as far advanced in mathematics as many of our college graduates of today. Just before my tenth birthday, my old friend passed into the great beyond and left a void in my life, my first great sorrow. At that time we were in camp where the city of Austin now stands. There were not enough children in our camp to employ a teacher, but about seven miles south of Austin, on the banks of Onion Creek, was a larger settlement known as the Tom McKinney branch of Austin's colony. Here, in a wooden-framed, cloth-covered schoolhouse, some twenty or more of the colonists' children daily studied under the tutelage of an old red-headed Scotch-Irish Presbyterian schoolmaster. Soon after the death of my grand-old, barren, exiled friend and teacher, I was sent to the Onion Creek School by my father. I had to ford the Colorado River and ride across a wide prairie studded with live oaks and dogwood thickets, and here and there a few post oaks. Many of the live oaks were draped in mustang grapevines on which hung great clusters of these fragrant, luscious, and juicy fruit. The landscape was one to awaken all the poetry in the soul of a young and ardent lover of nature. Each morning and evening, on my Indian pony, I rode the seven miles that lay between the school and my home. I did not fancy my teacher. Our spirits were not in accord. He was as far off from my old exiled friend in intellect and soul as the earth from the sun, and he was a stern and strict disciplinarian. He did not believe in sparing the rod and spoiling the child as he held a switch ever ready in his hand, and upon the least provocation, from boy or girl, he let it fall upon the offender with force, or gently as a reminder. I could feel neither love nor respect for him. Among the pupils was a young girl, just budding into womanhood, a Miss Mary Stone, whose father had been captured by Mexicans in what is known in Texas history as the Meyer Expedition. These men, some 250 strong, had made a raid into Mexico and had been captured by the soldiers of Santa Ana and confined in the castle of San Perote, down in Mexico, and every tenth man condemned to die. 
They were not chosen by name or number by their captors, but their selection left to the chance of drawing from 25 black beans and 225 white. Each prisoner was required to step up and draw a bean from the hat where they had all been placed. Those drawing black ones were shot. Mary's father drew a white one, and thus, for the present, was safe, though still a prisoner, and suffering all the tortures that a half-civilized people inflict on helpless men when in their power. My sympathy and love went out to Mary at her distress at the uncertainty of her father's fate. She would take me in her lap and curl my long hair, kiss me, and call me her little sweetheart, and I almost worshipped her. She was beginning the study of Latin, and I would write her exercises and thus keep her at the head of her class. One evening, just at recess, someone informed the teacher that I aided Mary and kept her at the head of the class. Without any warning, he carried me down to the spring, which was just under the bluff, a short distance from the tent house in which he taught, and near the spring, in the shadow of an old cottonwood log, he repeated a verse from the Bible about sparing the rod and spoiling the child. He then knelt and prayed a short prayer in which he asked his Heavenly Father to forgive the awful crime of which I had been guilty, and then rose and catching me by my long hair, almost lifting me from the ground, he administered an awful whipping such as I had never felt before. The first terrible blow from the lash almost took my breath, and the sting of it sent a thrill through every fiber of my being. I started to scream, but caught my breath and shut my teeth together, and let every muscle grow rigid and made no sound. He might have cut me in two, and I would not have flinched. Such feelings as crept over me are indescribable. I determined to have revenge on him for the outrage and pain inflicted, and I grew as calm and stolid as if made of stone. When he had finished, I saw the blood trickling down my feet from his cruel blows. I started straight up the bluff, my feet and hands clasping the limestone steps that we boys had cut in the soft rock to aid us in climbing its perpendicular sides. My intentions were to reach and saddle my pony and gallop away toward my home before my teacher could reach the school grounds and prevent me, as he would have to go down to the creek some hundred yards before he could get up on the bluff, and by the time he reached the tent I would be on my pony and flying across the prairie out of his reach. Just as I got to the top of the bluff I looked down and saw him climbing up close behind me. I did not hesitate a moment. I gathered a stone, sharp and jagged-edged, and with all the strength and pent-up anger I felt, I sent it at his head and struck him fair in the forehead, just as he was lifting his eyes to see how near he was to the top. As my stone struck, he dropped like a dead man to the bottom. I felt a great load, as it were, lifted from my soul. I felt that I had fully avenged my wrongs without aid from anyone. I took my bucket and books, saddled my pony, and without saying a word to anyone I mounted, and with a light heart, rode home. Some two or three hours after my arrival, I was chagrined and surprised to see the old fellow, all covered with soot and blood, ride up to our tent, dismount, and go in. In a few moments I was called by my father, and I saw my old teacher, covered with blood and his head bound in cobwebs and soot, and his brown linen suit that had been washed and bleached into white showed him up as the bloodiest man I had ever seen alive. I found that he had given my father his side of the controversy, and I made no defense. I aimed to kill him as he climbed the bluff behind me and had failed, and I was disappointed. My father gave me another terrible whipping in the presence of my teacher, and I bore it with the same unflinching stoicism and without a sound. But I made up my mind while the lash burned my tender skin that never again would I attend the school under the old Scotchman. Yes, I would die first. I there determined to run away from home the next day and go to Mexico to Castle San Perotti, where Mary's father was a prisoner, 
and live with the Mexicans, where neither my father nor teacher would dare come to hunt me. That night I molded bullets with two Negro boys until late in the night and secured a large buffalo horn containing five pounds of powder for my little rifle. The rifle was a present from General M.B. Lamar and my shot pouch a gift from General Sam Houston. I put my bullets in one end and my powder horn in the other of a rawhide sack or wallet as they were called in those days and I hid them in a crevice of a bluff on the river just above the ford on the bank of the Colorado, where I daily crossed it on my way to school. The next morning I took my rifle and a few charges of powder in the horn attached, and my bucket of lunch and a satchel of books, and giving my mother an extra hug and kiss, I mounted my pony and rode away. As soon as I crossed the divide between the river and Onion Creek, I set my satchel of books and bucket in the trail, and turning southwest, I put my pony in a lope and struck the trail that led from Austin to San Antonio, entering the ladder near Manshack Spring, about 12 miles from Austin. I turned down the trail in a gallop and rode up on the bluff that overlooks the San Marcos Springs. The trail makes a sudden turn to the east and follows down the river on top of the bluff for some distances before descending to the ford. Just as I made the turn, I saw, standing directly in front of me in the trail, an Indian in his war paint and with his bow at a ready. My first impulse was to raise my rifle and kill him before he could shoot me. But my gun was in its sling and swung to the pommel of my saddle, so I merely checked the speed of my pony and rode straight up to him. As I approached, the thought entered my brain. Why not go with the Indians instead of the Mexicans? and I made up my mind at once to go with them. I rode up and stopped, and he said in very good English, Where going? Without hesitation or the least embarrassment, I answered, With the Indians. That's good. Give me gun. I handed him my rifle, and as I did so, I glanced back up the trail, and at the very spot from which I would have tried to shoot my captor, about thirty other warriors had risen out of tall mesquite grass. They came in a body down the road, and each took a good look at me, several saying in very good English, How do? They exchanged my pony for a fresher one, as my long gallop of some seventeen or eighteen miles had begun to tell on him, and mounted me on one of theirs, and we started off in a northwesterly direction. And that concludes part one of the childhood of Lamar Fontaine, as recounted by him. If you found this interesting, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. And do check out our website, canebreaks.com. We hope to be revamping it in the near future and adding some new material. Thank you very much.